We've talked about two extremes of market structures, perfect competition with lots of firms and monopolies with only one. But most markets probably fall somewhere in between. Most of these in-between markets are better described as an oligopoly, a small group of firms in a market with substantial barriers to entry by additional firms. One example of an oligopoly that most of us are familiar with is the auto industry. In the US, the top seven firms control over 85% of the auto market. Think about GM, Ford, Toyota, and a handful of others. And the enormous fixed costs of starting a new car company makes it difficult for a new firm to enter the market. Most of these top auto companies have been around for over 75 years, and some have been around for more than 100. The youngest company in the top seven, Hyundai, is 50 years old. The barriers to entry for firms in the auto market are not insurmountable, however. For example, Tesla Motors was started in 2003 by multi-billionaire Elon Musk. But these barriers are large enough to greatly limit entry into the market. As a result, the auto market remains an oligopoly, with only a few dominant firms and limited entry for potential new firms. So how do firms behave in such an oligopoly? There are basically two possibilities. They can behave cooperatively or non-cooperatively. In the extreme, behaving cooperatively can lead to the formation of a cartel, a group of producers with an agreement to work together to limit output and to increase price and profit. The classic example of our cartel is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. OPEC is a cartel of more than a dozen oil producing countries, accounting for nearly half of global oil production and three quarters of the world's known oil reserves. Instead of competing with each other, increasing production and driving down prices, OPEC countries agree amongst themselves to limit production and keep prices higher. When firms, or in this case countries, in a cartel control most or all the market and cooperate to set quantities and prices, they effectively turn themselves into a monopoly. As we saw earlier, monopolies are great for producers. Lots of profit to go around for cartel members. But cartels can also be hard to keep together. OPEC countries, which differ greatly in their production costs, export capacities, and economic and political circumstances, often have difficulty agreeing on quantities and prices. And even when they do agree, there are large incentives for countries to cheat when it suits them. Even though it may be better for the cartel as a whole to limit production and keep prices high, it may be better for an individual country to produce more and grab a greater share of the available profit. For example, in 2008, one of the most important OPEC members, Saudi Arabia, ignored the wishes of the rest of the cartel and flooded the market with oil. Such defections made it hard to keep the rest of the cartel in line. Generally speaking, cartels are hard to keep together. So, in most cases, oligopolistic firms behave non-cooperatively. That means they compete with each other, but not in the same way firms compete under perfect competition. Remember that under perfect competition, so many firms are selling the product that no single firm could impact the price of that product. Firms are price takers. But in oligopolistic markets, firms can clearly influence the price. Ford gets to decide how much to charge for its cars. This is like monopoly, but with one important difference. Firms don't control the whole market. So now we have to figure out how firms set prices when they don't control the entire market like monopolies. This turns out to be really hard. Efforts to figure this out have given rise to the enormous growth of a branch of economics we'll explore in the next lecture, game theory.